Got that? Yeah. <laughs> My full name is Robert Dennis Michael Sanabria Ortiz. Sanabria, my father's name, Ortiz, my mother's maiden name. I was born in the South Bronx in New York City at St. Francis Hospital on June 2nd, 1957. How old was I when I started learning the music that I play today? Uh, it's funny, thinking about that, I would have to say since I was in my mother's womb because the music was always part of our lives. Music was being played in the house from the morning when the, we listened to Radio Wado, which was the, is the oldest Hispanic owned and run radio station in New York City. We wake up to the smell of my mother's coffee and to uh, the old boleros that they used to uh, play on the air in the morning. Boleros is a Cuban form of music, it's the ballad style. I was listening to that when I was in my mother's womb, the streets of New York City, et cetera, et cetera. So the greatest motivator in terms of uh, inspiring me to do what I do today is uh, where there's two people, the great jazz drummer Buddy Rich and the great ubiquitous musician who is the greatest musician that has ever lived in the history of Latin music, Maestro Tito Puente who happens to be a native New Yorker like me. I got to see him when I was 12 years old, doing a concert in front of my building in the projects where I lived in. And when I saw his big band and his majesty on the timbales, I said, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. And then I saw Maestro Buddy Rich on TV. He's considered the greatest soloist ever in terms of the history of jazz drums. At the same time, I fell in love with the sound of big band music because both of them played in big bands. And I got to see a lot of great big bands when I was a kid on the TV shows that I grew up watching. You have to understand, when I was growing up in the 1960s on TV, jazz was still part, or still had a connection to mainstream America. All the cartoons had jazz in them, particularly the Hanna-Barbera cartoons like Johnny Quest, Magilla Gorilla, Top Cat, The Jetsons, all had big band jazz in one form or another. And then all of the great Latin big bands like Machito and the Afro-Cubans, Tito Puentes Orchestra and Tito Rodriguez, fantastic, incredible big bands as well. It's not that I didn't listen to the Beatles, I did. I saw the Beatles on TV when they came here to the United States. I saw them on the Ed Sullivan Show and I was into Beatlemania, I had Beatlemania just like everybody else. But for some reason I gravitated more to the sounds that I was hearing from a jazz perspective. And drums were exciting to me. I noticed in all the bands, the vortex of everything was the drummer. And they were soloing, being featured as solos. Whereas the Beatles, they had great songs, great songwriters, etc. but Ringo was just keeping time. He wasn't really doing anything other than that and bobbing his head up and down. Whereas with drummers like Buddy Rich, uh, in his incredible big band, he's like riffing, soloing. Sonny Payne, we had many other great drummers that I saw. Louis Belson, just incredible. Gene Krupa, I saw all these people on TV growing up. It was amazing. I was the last generation to experience that. What is the most important aspect of the music that I play? Well, the music that I play is, all revolves on the, on the one rubric, which is jazz. And when we're talking about jazz, you're talking about freedom and ultimate sophistication from a harmonic standpoint. And with Latin jazz, Latin-oriented jazz from a rhythmic standpoint. Latin jazz used to be just Afro-Cubic rhythms and Brazilian rhythms, but now it's expanded to the rhythms of all 21, 22 countries in Latin America. So you could have a group playing jazz, but using Venezuelan joropo or uh, Colombian cumbia or Puerto Rican, one of the rhythms from the Puerto Rican bomba complex. Whereas before, the basic rhythms we used were just Afro-Cuban and Brazilian, like mambo, cha-cha-cha, uh, guaguancó, etc. Son Montuno, and from Brazilian music, samba and bossa nova. But that 
has expanded over the years. So if we're gonna play something using Cuban mambo, it's gotta be authentic and not jive. And it can't be done in a, in a kind of novelty kind of way, which is the way most musicians outside of the culture approach the music. Our job is to play the music as rhythmically, authentically as possible. But on top of that, you could do whatever you want harmonically. To answer your question very shortly, succinctly, and bluntly, siguiendo las tradiciones, keeping the traditions alive, but building upon them and moving them forward with, with respect to the past. The biggest misconception in terms of any music that is jazz oriented, it is intellectually above the audience that might be listening to it. The music in and of itself was a dance music. It was the popular music of the 30s, 40s, 50s, I would say into the late 50s, going into the early 60s. And as I said before, my generation was the last generation to ex have experienced jazz oriented music. And it became associated with drug culture, which is hilarious because rock and roll then became associated with drug culture. Jazz musicians fulfilled that role in the 30s and 40s. And it was like, oh man, the jazz band is coming to town. Watch out, lock up your daughters, <laughs> that kind of stuff. So, so, but it was dance music. It was music of the people and was born from the black experience. It, it represented freedom and it still does. And that's why it's so attractive to people outside of the United States. The misconception is too that is it isn't accessible. There are some forms of jazz that are on an incredibly high level of intellectual expression, on the level of any of the great classical composers. But there are some forms of jazz that are just hit you straight on in a very incredibly visceral way. In fact, I would say if it was not for blues and jazz, you wouldn't have rock and roll today or popular music as we know it today because they draw upon the elements of the blues and jazz. From the blues, we get the cultural expression that every vocalist today uses in rock and roll, pop music, etc. No bending on the blues scale or blues approach. Every rock lead guitarist is drawing upon the blues when they play lead. And in terms of improvisation on a virtuosic level, you hear virtuosic guitarists and heavy metal, etc. That represent part of the jazz tradition. And of course, improvisation, which is part of the jazz tradition. So without blues and jazz, you don't, and you don't have Latin jazz either. I think part of the misconceptions too is today is because young people have not been exposed to the music. They haven't heard it. So it's like a foreign language, but there are ways to get young people into the music because there are many forms of music that are jazz related. For example, as I said before, blues, you could take a group like Tower of Power, who are like the University of Funk. You play them for somebody. They're not realizing that all of the horn lines and the, the chords that they're hearing, the horns playing, all come from big band jazz. And you hear James Brown as well. Uh, he's using horns as well. James Brown loved jazz and he's the DNA of hip hop rhythmically. So today the, the misconceptions come mostly from uh, people not knowing the music, not being exposed to it. But I've, listen, we just recently did a concert at Washington Square Park with my 21 piece Big Band. It was basically three quarters of the audience was young people, college age people and younger. They were mesmerized by the music. They couldn't believe it. First of all, they were in shock because they never had heard anything like that before. It's a stunning kind of a thing. It's like falling in love for the first time. It's, it's indescribable. My mission and my job is not only to entertain people, but also to inspire them and turn on the next generation of listeners and fans and hopefully young musicians. The great Art Blakey, the great jazz drummer from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania said, any place where jazz is played is a sacred place. So thank you for coming to church. But the best moment I would say is several years ago, we played my uh, interpretation of West Side Story, West Side Story Reimagined. I believe we did it October 18th, 2019 at Lincoln Center, out of doors. And we had an audience, I think over 10,000 people there. And that's the greatest uh, accomplishment I've done in terms of the of a performance the re and the reason that, that that moment was so great in terms of the performance was not only because the band was firing on all cylinders and everything the emo the emotional content 
of the music was brought forth in a stunning way to the audience. But the fact that we brought the whole city together, it was just an amazing thing. What Octavio Paz, the great Mexican writer, calls the multiverse, which is like, it's a big salad bowl that you have all of the different colors in the salad bowl, but you can tell which color it is, the, the lettuce, the tomatoes, everything, the cheese, whatever you have in it, and it but it's all together, bringing out this beautiful uh, flavor. I remember this dis distinctly because it was the one year anniversary, the Tiki Torch Racist March that happened down south. And I had remembered about, I remembered it and I gathered the band together and I told them, the band, I said, you know, a year ago on this day, that happened and Today, we're going to wipe away all of that and bring this city together. And uh, we did it because of Maestro Leonard Bernstein's music. Another memorable moment for me was uh, headlining at the Apollo Theater, which is the center of African-American culture in the world. We did a, a concert in honor of uh, one of my mentors, Barrio Balsa, for his 100th birthday, celebrating his centennial. They asked us to to do that because I was Mario's drummer. So I was very honored that they would even ask. It was just gratified to see my name on the marquee and the name of the band up there. The greatest accomplishment in terms of my life, the birth of my son, Roberto Jose. <laughs> what keeps me motivated, the music in and of itself, but also the young people I, that I teach. I teach at NYU, I teach at uh, the New School, and I taught uh, for 20 years at the Manhattan School of Music. And when I go into the classroom, just seeing those young people's faces and seeing them light up when they learn about the history of the music and they get to perform this music for the first time, many of them have no inkling what the music is about. Even the Latino students that I've had, because they've been disenfranchised, they've been separated from their culture for so long. And when I see them light up and play the music and play it with the same intensity and passion, well, it's, it's gratifying. I'm a firm believer in what the great Dizzy Gillespie used to say, uh, one of the avatars of what became known as bebop, the progressive form of jazz that we are all judged by today as jazz musicians. He said, as long as there's one black person left on planet Earth singing the blues, jazz will never die. Well, as long as there's one person on planet Earth doing this, what we call the clave of rumba, the music will never die. It's harder today because most people, not only young people, but most adults, they're just completely disconnected from anything cultural in terms of appreciating culture on any level. Today, you download something off of the computer. All you know is the name of the artist. It doesn't tell you who played, who's the keyboard player, who's the guitar player, even if there's a real drummer on there, or who's the bass player, etc. Musicians have become anonymous. When I was growing up, musicians were still considered heroes. People wanted to grow up to become a musician that inspired you and that you wanted to grow up to be like them, and they would inspire you to study music, learn whatever instrument it was that you fell in love with. But today, most young people just worship celebrity and they want to grow up to be celebrities. And you can be a, very, a celebrity very easily today through YouTube. <laughs> or Instagram or TikTok. And that saddens me because musicians are, to me are like high priests, griots. They're the avatars of culture, they're the avatars of history. We need music in our lives. It's what inspires us, it's what keeps us alive. You study the history of the concentration camps during World War II. People were starving, people were being beaten, people were being killed, but there were still people in those concentration camps making music, believe it or not. Why? Because of the human need for cultural expression. And for us, Cultural expression is our medicine. My parents, would, they would, my father would put on a, a beautiful bolero, a recording of a beautiful bolero by, interpreted by Santos Colón with the Tito Puente Orchestra. And all of a sudden they're dancing and you forget about, they forgot about what they were fighting about. And we've lost that. My, last, my generation is the last generation that grew up with learning how to dance. And when you learn how to dance as a young man, you learn how to respect women 
right away because you have to respect them on the dance floor. You have to also learn to respect yourself. The simple act of just combing your hair is a sign of self-respect. Care about what you look like. You care about what you represent walking down the street. I get to pass on those traditions with my students. And anybody, any young people that I come in contact with or when they see my orchestra or any of my, the groups I lead performing, when the, wor the worth of musicians uh, has been disenfranchised to the point where nobody even cares who's playing guitar on a recording with Lady Gaga, then there's something wrong. Part of it is because art, music, etc., has been cut out mostly from the public school educational system. We need to look at ourselves and say, hey, wait a minute. The way people treat each other today, something is off kilter here. And part of it is because young people today don't learn how to respect each other. How do you respect, learn how to respect each other? One of the ways is through music. Just a simple music appreciation course. Hey, check this out. This is Bach and Beethoven. Yeah, but check this out. This is Prince, James Brown, Duke Ellington, John Coltrane, Tito Puente. Hey, but I don't really like that. Yeah, but I don't really like what you play. He goes, yeah, but well, check it out. There's, some, there's gotta be some common ground here. The common ground is beauty, truth. Because these the cultural expression is really just truth. That's all it is. I remember when I was a kid, they took us to see a rehearsal of the New York Philharmonic. And it was just incredible. I had never seen that before I heard a symphony orchestra. I had heard symphonies on TV, in movie music and all. I didn't pay it no mind or anything. But when I actually saw and experienced the cellos and the basses and the timpani and the percussion and the background. And I was like, in the violin, I goes, oh my God. It was like, it, it was one of those Rubicon moments in your life. It changes your perspective on things. We need to do the same thing today. And uh, sadly, if you talk about all of the violence that's happening today, all of the racial strife, the disrespect amongst different peoples. Part of it is because most of those most of those people, if you started interviewing them and talking to them, art, culture, music, theater, poetry, none of that is part of their lives. I guarantee you. Somebody who is appreciative of music, theater, art, poetry, dance, is not gonna think about violence or anything like that. They know there's a better way. And Leonard Bernstein said it beautifully, how will we fight violence? We'll do that. We'll make better, more beautiful music, art, theater, poetry, etc. What is the philosophy of jazz or any form of music that's related to jazz? It's cultural expression coming from the African, American, African, Caribbean experience. Putting the improviser on the highest level in terms of being a master storyteller. And encompassing one ethos, which is what? Freedom.